Today we present America's highest military decoration, the Medal of Honor, to Private Henry Johnson, who served in World War I nearly a century ago. We can't change what happened to too many soldiers like him who went uncelebrated because our nation judged them by the color of their skin and not the content of their character. But we can do our best to make it right. In many respects, what some of these men believed was that France did represent something greater than they had experienced because of this notion of liberté, égalité, et fraternité. America was always in a problematic situation, claiming to be democratic and, claim, and, and, and fighting for democracy in faraway places and not practicing it at home. They went to Europe, uh, they risked their lives, they distinguished themselves, uh, they came back and nothing changed. And not only did nothing change, things in many ways got worse. The story of Henry Johnson is the story of the hero America forgot. The story of a young black man who fought in the First World War in the name of racial equality. It was an ideal that was beyond his wildest dreams in his own country. A man of color serving as a private in a regiment composed entirely of African American volunteers. Thanks to historians like Jeffrey Sammons, America has recovered its memory. And a century later, America finally honored a son of whom she is proud. This is the most impressive monument to an African soldier that I've ever seen or even read or heard about, honoring a, an African-American soldier from any war. And it also mentions that he was the first American awarded the Croix de Guerre with Palm uh, for valor. Henry Johnson won his military honors in France on the front in the Argonne with his brothers in arms, the 369th Infantry Regiment. This was the black regiment that the US Army did not want. In New York one February day in 1919, the history of the civil rights movement took root right here on the cobblestones of Harlem in New York City's black district, their district. The crowd cheered its combatants, their Harlem hellfighters, on their return from hell. Among them was Henry Johnson, a son of Albany, recognized as a war hero. And a famous musician, James Reese Europe, a Broadway star turned army officer. For the duration of the parade, America temporarily forgot the color of their skin. Black people were considered to be uh, biologically uh, inferior. Uh, they were viewed as culturally uh, inferior. And uh, this notion of black inferiority uh, has existed uh, in America for a very long time. As with 90% of black Americans, the story of the Harlem soldiers began in the country's deep south. In the former Confederate states, blacks were free, but far from equal with whites. They were Americans, but they were not true citizens. In the south, racial segregation was enshrined in law. During uh, enslavement, um, there was this insistence that black people were not fully human. Our court had even ruled that they were three-fifths human. Uh, because if white slave owners had to acknowledge that black people were just like them, they'd have to confront the immorality of, of slavery, uh, the, the barbarity of it. But our slave owners wanted to feel moral and just and Christian while they owned other people. So they created this idea that black people are different than white people. As soon as he was old enough to stand, Henry Johnson worked, first with his parents in the tobacco fields of his native Carolina. 
Condemned to misery and humiliation, he had no land, no property, no civil rights, and no hope of emancipation. For Private Henry Johnson as a child, the future promised to be a life of terror, one in which the white supremacists made the law. We got laws um, against uh, intermarriage between the races. We, we got laws uh, separating blacks and whites in all aspects of life so that if you were to be sworn in on, in the courtroom, you had to be sworn in on different Bibles. Uh, black people were uh, prevented from uh, uh, playing chess or checkers or any of that with, with, with whites. On the eve of World War I, there were two Americas for black Americans. In the South, blacks were lynched. In the North, they could, in principle, be hired without distinction of color of skin. Millions of blacks hit the road and headed north to the big cities. When he was 10 years old, Henry Johnson and his parents fled the South to Albany in New York State. Young Henry found work as a porter. James Reese Europe was also a child when he left the cotton fields of Alabama in the profoundly racist Deep South to settle in New York in 1904. Growing up, music filled the air for this future lieutenant of the New York Regiment. His mother was a piano teacher, while he and his brothers tried their hand at any instrument they could. By 1910, James Reese Europe was an established performer on the New York music scene. He was by then 30 years old and running the Clef Club, a large band of black musicians, which also acted as a trade union. Hardly any black musicians back then were even paid. There were practically no professional musicians. You couldn't really earn a living playing music. So they would set a minimum price and perform concerts. And in that way, musicians could play and earn a little money. He immediately knew they needed to be taken seriously. How do you go about being taken seriously? Easy. First, the band dressed like white men, with smart suits and ties, and started playing on time. And they took it seriously. They didn't drink on stage. Things like that counted for a lot. So that's how they made their way into the upper echelons of white society. In the North, power and ideas remained in the hands of whites, but a few blacks managed to access the major universities. A leading figure of this black intellectual elite was a man named W.E.B. Du Bois, the first black American to obtain a doctorate from Harvard University. In 1909, he founded the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People the very first American organization to defend what would later become known as civil rights. Du Bois explains that he did not really uh, think in terms of race until he was in, uh, he was in elementary school. And um, the kids, for some reason, decided that they would exchange friendship cards. And, uh, and he said that uh, this uh, white girl, you know they, they, you know, they were all about, you know, maybe six, seven years old and that this white girl refused to take a card from him. And that that's when he realized that he was, he was somehow different. And, uh, and then he says that uh, at that point, at that point, I, I, I never desired again to uh, be in the white world. Du Bois gave a name to this invisible border that separated America into two colors that do not mix. He called it the color line. Through his magazine and mouthpiece, The Crisis, Du Bois became a spokesman for millions of African Americans. His voice carried weight everywhere, from large black metropolises to the cotton fields. August 1914, 
France joined the first ever world conflict in history. Soon the old continent was being laid waste by a modern war, one in which the law was being laid down by steel. Soon the soldiers began to feel the weight of their kit. The war would be a long and terrible one. America, with its huge population and formidable industrial power, was the only nation capable of tipping the tide. But for the US president, meddling in this European war was out of the question. He had promised the American people neutrality. In the eyes of the world, Woodrow Wilson was a pacifist, even though in the country he led, 12 million blacks were still second-class citizens. The war in Europe breathed new life into the US economy. Between 1912 and 1916, America doubled its exports to the old continent. But the business community pushed Wilson to choose sides. The battleground became an economic one. And when you examine how world trade was structured in 1914, the US was doing far more business with Britain than it was with Germany and Austria. So as the months went by, it was clearly in the economic interest of American businessmen for the Allied camp to prevail over the Germans. The Germans quickly understood that they needed to finish the war before the Americans intervened. The Kaiser gave his troops six months to bring Britain to its knees by cutting off the supply of raw materials from the United States. A worried Woodrow Wilson resisted German aggression. He put up a good show until his re-election in November 1916. But the following spring, the British intercepted a secret telegram in which the Germans offered Mexico an alliance against the United States. This swayed American opinion in favor of the war. On April 1st, 1917, Wilson addressed Congress and insisted that the United States did not choose to go to war, rather, the Germans had forced their hand. America went to war in the name of democracy and the defense of human rights. For the millions of black Americans living under the yoke of segregation, this message acted as a provocation. How do you go away as a country and fight for democracy? And, you, and that democracy is the greatest principle in the world that you fight and die for. And then at the same time, you, you, you have second class citizens. You, you have black people who are being lynched. You have black people who are referred to as, as niggas and monkeys and so on and so forth. And very intense uh, racism. Contrary to what Wilson hoped, few Americans volunteered. So for the first time since the American Civil War, conscription was made obligatory. A total of four million Americans would be mobilized, including 370,000 African Americans, galvanized by a unifying message from Du Bois. We must forget our special grievances and close ranks, shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. It's very confusing to African Americans. Why defend a society that won't defend you? But many African American leaders thought that serving in the war would change things for African Americans. W.E.B. Du Bois and others said, look, let's go show our, our prove our mettle, our strength, our bravery. And if we fight to defend this country and we prevail, things will change. It wasn't a first in the history of the United States. Many times, African Americans have paid the blood tax in all wars, but never in such large numbers. Yet the United States military did not want them and had no desire to see black men carrying rifles. Segregation also existed within the army. Racism was the first enemy African Americans had to fight. 
In northern cities, however, few regiments were reserved for people of color. These were the National Guards, and this is where a large number of African Americans enlisted. In the Harlem District of New York City, the 15th Regiment of the National Guard opened its doors to volunteers in 1916. At the corner of 7th Avenue and 132nd Street, the Lafayette Theater acted as a recruitment office. Candidates came mainly from the neighboring districts of Harlem, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. But some made the trip from as far away as Texas or Alabama, fleeing Southern drill sergeants. Among the crowd of men signing up for the New York Regiment were the Albany Porter Henry Johnson and Jazz King James Reese Europe, who would become one of the regiment's six black officers, fighting alongside its 40 white officers. James Reese Europe actually uh, studied military science and was a cadet uh, in high school in Washington, D.C. So he actually had some kind of ex military experience and seemed to have a real sort of uh, desire to be part of a, a combat unit. Leading the regiment was Colonel William Hayward, known for his progressive ideas towards blacks. This former lawyer from Nebraska also acted as an advisor to the governor of New York. Both were members of the Union League Club, uh, which at that time had a reputation as being racially enlightened. It supported Abraham Lincoln and the Union. It also supported the recruitment of blacks for a, um, a militia unit or uh, in the Civil War. For Colonel Hayward, a good regiment was above all a good band, so the presence of James Reese Europe was a blessing. But the Broadway star had not signed up to conduct musicians. He spelled out his terms to Hayward. James Reese Europe made demands on uh, William Hayward, the colonel, that he thought that Hayward couldn't meet in terms of the number of musicians uh, and also the salary that these musicians would require. Hayward uh, met his uh, demands and, and called his bluff, as we say, and, and Europe had to accept the assignment. But he still wanted to be uh, seen as a leader of, of combat soldiers and not as a leader of the band. The band leader enlisted some outstanding musicians, recruited from as far away as Puerto Rico, in some cases by simply placing ads in the African-American community's newspapers. Negro musicians, do you want to do your duty in the most famous military band of all time? Hurry, only a few vacancies left. With a band of some 50 musicians, the 15th New York Regiment was finally complete. In June 1917, the War Ministry decided that the National Guard units must regroup within divisions. Hayward requested to join the 42nd Division in New York, the Rainbow Division, which brought together National Guard regiments from 27 different states. Hayward dreamed of seeing his black troops parade in New York before going off to war. The 42nd Division's reply to their application is that black is not a color of the rainbow. Well, that's a fascinating excuse because white is not a color of the rainbow either. But the point, the essential point here is that for the Rainbow Division, which was basically going to, the notion was going to accept everybody, what that lets you know is that the American melting pot does not apply to black people. Colonel Hayward was deeply aggrieved. But he promised his men an outstanding parade on the return home. U.S. military headquarters eventually created provisional divisions to which they assigned the black units of the National Guards. The New York Regiment then became the 369th Infantry Regiment.
December 13, 1917, it was the big day for the Harlem Regiment. Ahead lay France, the war, and an opportunity to prove their loyalty to the Stars and Stripes. Back home, they would be free men, equal, full citizens. They were ready to pay the ultimate price. Henry Johnson and James Reese Europe sailed past the Statue of Liberty, oblivious to the broken chain at its feet, honoring the abolition of slavery. They thought of their ancestors who made the same transatlantic journey in the opposite direction, chained to the ship. They're down in the hold of the ship and bunking right on top of each other. And they've never been to sea before. And they're having a heck of a time as they go through the North Atlantic and the seas are high. They're all sick. We're vomiting and everything else that stinks down here. During the crossing, the Russians and Germans negotiated a peace. This was bad news, as it allowed German troops to retreat to the Western Front. Millions of men would soon be facing the Allied armies. More than ever, Pétain was desperate for the Americans to arrive. By the end of 1917, the war had already killed five million people of all nationalities. But neither side had gained the upper hand. A huge scar disfigured France from the north to the Swiss border. The men remaining in the front line were hungry and exhausted. But they had to hold out, wait for relief, wherever it was available and whatever its skin color. Pershing, the U.S. Force's supreme commander, had already been in France for several weeks. With him were 150,000 soldiers, fresh men who, for the time being, he refused to send to the front as reinforcements. President Wilson had been clear. There must be no amalgamation. U.S. troops would fight, but only under the American flag and only when there were enough of them to be sure victory. December 26, 1917. After 13 days at sea, the Pocahontas docked in the port of Brest. On board was the New York Regiment, America's first black soldiers, and music from the New World. Ragtime, with its syncopated rhythms, had never before been heard on the old continent. This was the day that jazz, too, arrived in Brest. When the band played and James Reese Europe saw an old woman swinging her hips, he was certain that American music would soon conquer the whole world. But the men parading behind the musicians no longer wore their unit's uniform. They were on a completely different assignment. Their initial rival is in, in Brest which is basically where all the Americans unload their ships and so on. And then they get sent to uh, a place not f uh, that far away. It's an overnight trip called Montoire. Montoire, Brittany, Camp Number 4. This is where the war began for Hayward's men, and it was nothing like they had imagined. Once their rifles had been confiscated, they were parked like cattle in perfunctory barracks. The first battlefield for the New York soldiers was a huge railway yard, where their enemies were the cold, back-breaking work and the iron discipline imposed by the U.S. command. Segregation was practiced in the southern United States. 
and American barracks were subject to strict segregation laws. The U.S. military police enforced segregation. Everything was kept separate. The feeling was that the habit should not be changed just because they were in France. A great deal of lobbying went on within U.S. military HQ to ensure that the blacks were kept away from active service. Some predicted social unrest when the soldiers returned home, and many thought blacks would be bad combatants. When it came to the military, Pershing was very conservative. And for him, the army was a white force with black auxiliaries who could maybe unload boots, work on the docks, etc. He was quite happy for them to build railroads, trenches, and do some of the work. But their rifle had to be a pickaxe. One of the things that the men observed in the labor battalions was that it was like slavery again. It's a hell of a time because uh, they're not at the front. They don't know why they're not at the front. They're stuck doing this. And Hayward is trying to figure out a way to get them out of there and get them to the front. Colonel Hayward's greatest ally was Pétain. The French general needed men. Black or white, it didn't matter to him. Pershing, though, still refused to put his troops under Allied command. Within the New York regiment, a single small group managed to escape the forced labor. And they were the musicians in the regimental band. Wherever they went, the French welcomed them as saviors with open arms. James Europe and his band discovered a new world. But soon the musicians were called upon to play an entirely different score. Under pressure from Pétain, Pershing eventually surrendered his black regiments. On March 4, 1918, the Harlem fighters were assigned to General Gouraud's 4th Army. General Hayward's men left Montois for Conantre in the Marne. They would finally see combat under French command. Hayward says, uh, well, we're like a, a little black baby that the American expeditionary forces have deposited on your doorstep, the French army's doorstep, and the a uh, French colonel who has a sign on him says, English spoken here, says, welcome, little black baby. <laughs> and so they hit it off very well, and the regiment hits it off very well with his French colleagues. A most beautiful thing has happened, Hayward wrote. We are now a combat unit. The French are wonderful, wonderful. I'm happy to say there are no other American troops near us. The Harlem Hellfighters met their brothers in arms, men who were exhausted but kind to them. They also discovered French rations, dark tobacco, and two liters of red wine a day, soon replaced by coffee or sugar. The men laughed, chatted, and shook hands. It was an amazing moment of communion. In a letter home, one of them confided, the French do not care for race issues. They treat us so well that I have to look at myself in a mirror to remember that I am black. For black soldiers, literally born into slavery, their parents were born into slavery. This was not a country where black people had ever experienced freedom or autonomy. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a foreign notion that people would respect you and not uh, exclude you based on your color. And so the experience of going to Europe and being around people who valued you uh, despite the fact that you were black, who embraced you despite the fact that you were black, was transformative for many of these African-American soldiers. 
Among the French infantry, the skin color of American soldiers was not an issue. The only concerns were supplies, choice of uniforms, and armaments. In the end, American soldiers kept their olive green uniform, but had to wear the horizon blue Adrian helmet of the French infantry. Their rifles, too, would be French. While the Harlem Hellfighters integrated seamlessly, they were keen to display their affiliation to the United States. So they decided to sew a badge onto their uniforms. To that end, they opted for the most American of insignias, a rattlesnake, the symbol adopted by Benjamin Franklin during the War of Independence. Rattlesnake was also the nickname given by slaves to their white masters. Before going to the front, the men had to familiarize with trench warfare. In the spring of 1918, they arrived in the Massij region, in the Maum. This network of trenches had been taken back from the Germans in 1915. The operation cost both sides many hundreds of lives. Since early spring, a major offensive had been underway in the region. During the day, the men trained to advance in the forest of Argonne. At night, they had to defend their position. The Bois d'Ozy was a quiet area, simply because it had experienced no massive destruction or major operations. That's why the African Americans were sent here, simply to get used to focusing on life in a trench, how to live there, how to advance. A whole schooling was required, a form of introduction training. But it's quite complicated because at night, it's hard to find your way around, and it's difficult to keep in contact with your fellow men. And of course, the forest has lots of little animals making noises. So the slightest noise or rustling immediately put the men on high alert. On the evening of May 15th, two soldiers from Company C took their guard duty on the front line. One of them was Henry Johnson, the young Albany porter. Two privates, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts, are on guard duty. They hear noises and they realize that they can hear someone cutting the wire. This was a patrol, a German patrol, and they're about to attack. And Roberts and Johnson are about to respond when this shower of grenades comes over. Roberts is wounded, Needham Roberts is wounded and goes down. And so Johnson is there on his feet. Um, he shoots the first one, then turns the rifle around, clubs the next one in the head as he approaches. Um, and at this point realizes that the other Germans are grabbing Roberts, they're seizing him under the shoulders and by his feet because they're gonna take him away as a prisoner. Johnson pulls his bolo knife out, leaps on the shoulders of one of the Germans, the German carrying Roberts under the arms, stabs him, comes off of him as the German is going down to confront another German who shoots him at point-blank range, and the German closes on him, but closes too close to Johnson, and Johnson comes up and guts him, uh, stabs him in the stomach, at which point um, the German patrol decides it's time to leave. Henry Johnson is very lucky. Uh, that his um, heroic action occurred one day before there was this visit from three very prominent 
American journalists, Lincoln Iyer, Martin Green, and Irving Cobb. Uh, and they asked uh, Arthur Little and Colonel Hayward, had there been any, you know, uh, engagements, uh, anything that exciting they should know about, and uh, Little told them about what happened with Henry Johnson. Originally from Kentucky, Irvin Cobb was the archetypal Southern journalist. In his article, studded with racist cliches, he recounted the heroic night of Private Johnson. What he saw in France that day changed his outlook on black Americans. Personally, he wrote, I believe that a word that has been uttered billions of times in our country, the word nigger, will merely be another way of spelling the word American. As described by Irvin Cobb, the exploits of Henry Johnson seemed to move the color line. Henry Johnson, the first American soldier to receive the Croix de Guerre in France, was black, a descendant of slaves. The black American press was exultant. Even Pershing issued a glowing statement. But this reward was a major embarrassment for U.S. military headquarters. This black regiment was becoming a little too high profile. By the end of June 1918, the Kaiser divisions that had been fighting in Russia were now in France. The German strategists were smiling, unaware that a million Americans had already landed with another 250,000 men due to arrive on a monthly basis. Numerically, the German army would soon be overwhelmed. It was now six months since the Harlem soldiers had landed. Fear and death were part of their daily lives. 10 days at the front, 10 days behind the lines. 10 days in support. Nobody escaped this routine, not even the musicians. One night, when Private James Reese Europe was taking his turn at the front, he fell victim to a gas attack. Despite his mask, he was overcome and woke up in a hospital. But for him, anything could be set to music, and war inspired the king of jazz. Europe spent his time writing music, putting swing into the gunfire. He handed a visiting friend his most recent composition, On Patrol in No Man's Land. This piece of film is a bona fide treasure, preserved in the military archives. It records a performance in Chalon-sur-Marne on Independence Day, the 4th of July, 1918. It is quite possibly the first ever performance of a ragtime from the trenches, one of the many pieces composed by Lieutenant Europe during the war in France. At American military headquarters in Chaumont, the assimilation of the Harlem Hellfighters into the French army was causing a great deal of unease. They certainly did not want liberty, equality, and fraternity to become their motto. The American military chief set about trying to impose his view of black Americans on the French. He asked Lieutenant Colonel Linard, the French-American liaison officer, to write a memo outlining how colored soldiers should be treated. Pershing told him to write. He was ordered to write it. He didn't write this on his own, of his own accord. But the point was to say, do not treat African Americans, do not treat colored soldiers as equals. Do not shake the hands of colored officers. Um, keep them away from the French public and, and French women because they will get ideas and 
with those ideas, they cannot return to the United States where they are regarded as inferior and untrustworthy, and this will always be the case. But this clearly racist document bore the seal of the French army, a tricolor force which counted among its ranks thousands of black soldiers hailing from its colonies. Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau told Pershing that following these recommendations was out of the question. A scandal was avoided, but the document clearly highlights the extent to which the U.S. military was blighted by discrimination. In late August 1918, Allied military intelligence informed French military headquarters that 40 German divisions were on the move in Reims and Verdun, near the Algonne Forest, close to where the Harlem Hellfighters were stationed. Foch and his allies were preparing a large-scale counteroffensive. The New York soldiers were placed on standby. They would lead the assault in an area of the Argonne Forest they knew well. Ahead of them lay a difficult topography, full of mounds, ravines, undergrowth, and bunkers, where the Germans lurked, waiting for them. 3,000 men advanced along this 1.5-kilometer corridor, tackling both its natural defenses and the artificial defenses of their adversary. The advance was meant to take one day, but in the end, it took three days to reach the northern edge at Séchou. Deserted by its population at the outset of the war, the tiny hamlet of Seychou was a German stronghold, with a heavily armed unit based there. For the Harlem troops, it would be the ultimate fight, the toughest as well. Taking Seychou would open the road to the Rhine, but the Germans had been instructed to hold out, whatever the cost. On September 26, 1918, the Hellfighters took up position less than a kilometer from Massige. In the early hours of the attack, the German artillery wreaked carnage. But little by little, meter by meter, the New York infantry gained ground, engaged the enemy, and finally seized their objective, suffering very heavy losses along the way. Among the American ranks, Colonel Hayward's troops were the most decimated of the war. His was also the regiment that remained longest on the front line, 191 days, and the first to reach the banks of the Rhine. Hayward's regiment and 170 of its men were given the Croix de Guerre, making the 369th the most decorated American regiment of the First World War. In the Harlem district of New York, a monument, identical to the one in Seychelles, is a reminder of the sacrifice these black soldiers made for freedom and equality. February 17, 1919, Colonel Hayward kept his promise. His Harlem Hellfighters paraded in New York from Fifth Avenue to Harlem. The faces belong to men who have been transformed by war. These are the new Negroes, proud to be black, American, and victorious. In New York that day, the color line was forgotten. 
The triumphal return of these soldiers, acclaimed by a mixed black and white crowd, marked the first act of the civil rights movement. They're looking at all these men in these great coats and these helmets, and uh, they, there's this impression of power, you could say black power in this case, which is in one way um, impressive, in another way probably terrifying. Harlem Hellfighters is a great name, except when you come back to Alabama and Mississippi. It's a scary name. It's a name that's going to provoke alarm. And so a lot of the violence takes place literally the day when men arrive back uh, to their communities in their uniforms. With just the sight of a black person in a military uniform was a provocation, could create a violent response. And many were asked to take off their uniforms uh, 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 and stand naked on these train platforms or in bus depots as a way of expressing their, um, their submission uh, to racial hierarchy. And when they refused, um, they were killed. They were beaten. They were, they were assaulted. And those that survived wanted to flee because it wasn't possible uh, to continue with that indignation uh, and still feel any pride. In Paris, the victory procession of July 14, 1919 was also marked by disgrace. All the countries that contributed to the victory were honored, including U.S. troops, of course, but not African Americans. Pershing forbade them to share this moment of global jubilation. The few American units still in France did the dirty work. They were ordered to clean the trenches and battlefields to recover American corpses and bury them with dignity. We return, we return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France. And by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States of America or know the reason why. So and so that's a very, it's, powerful. it's very powerful, very powerful, yes. And so, um, uh, as I said, he's, he's under a lot of criticism for having assumed that once black people fought courageously in the war that they were going to get democracy here. And so he's realizing that he was wrong. In 1919, peace had settled around the world, but not in the United States. During that year, 77 American men were lynched, including at least 10 veterans, who were still wearing their uniforms on the day of their execution. In Washington, the Ku Klux Klan and its five million followers gave a show of strength the color line was still an insurmountable barrier. Du Bois knew that in his own country, any kind of truce was still a long way off. That struggle for racial equality is absolutely continuing today. We have not, we have not gotten there yet. And in fact, I don't think anybody is really free yet in America. We're still burdened by this history of racial inequality. It's created a kind of smog in the air, and we all breathe it in. So yes, the challenges of this history continue, and the legacy that this history has created uh, has created real problems that we have to overcome, which is why I think it's so important to learn uh, about how we got here. 
As soon as they were demobilized, James Reese Europe and his Hellfighters Band recorded the pieces he had composed during the war in New York before embarking on a nationwide tour. On May 9, 1919, in Boston, the King of Jazz was murdered by one of his musicians. A lawyer who hunted down gangsters during Prohibition, Colonel Hayward made a failed bid to become mayor of New York City and state governor. He instead became an explorer through Africa and Antarctica. Henry Johnson, Albany's little soldier who became a war hero, made a living by telling his exploits. Until the day he told the truth about the humiliation suffered by blacks and segregation in the army, he died destitute on the street on July 1, 1929, forgotten by all. Despite his many injuries, the U.S. military had refused to recognize his disability.